Discovering Your Voice, a place where we share stories. My name is Bonnie. I'm Caroline. And I'm Colette. And today we interrupt our programming for an important public safety announcement Bonnie's bringing to us. I have a story to tell today about kayaking. And I love kayaking. It, it's become one of my greatest passions. When um, actually Colette was the first one that introduced me to, Colette, to kayaking back in, if you can believe it, Colette, 2001. And she had some, some kayaks that her family had purchased and she took us out along with another friend on a small little lake. And I was very reluctant to go. I thought my only experience with something near or close to a kayak was a canoe. And my sister and I had gone in canoes before and I was horrible at it. I, I didn't have the paddling down. I couldn't go into a headwind. We couldn't direct it where it was supposed to go. We'd be all over the place. It was awful. Plus, I always felt like I was going to fall out. It was tipsy. So I, when Colette said, you know, we're going to try out some kayaks, I was very nervous. I thought, oh, well, I'm going to fall out of this for sure. I will capsize. But the second I sat in that kayak, it was like magic. It was like, ah, I've arrived and it was wonderful. And I, I, even though it was only once in 2001, that feeling never left me. So fast forward to 2010 and um, when I purchased my first kayak and it was just love at first sight. <laughs> And every opportunity I went, I would go kayaking with my friends and I actually got many other friends involved in kayaking. But of course, with kayaking, you need to be safe. So we did the very safe thing and we got training. So we, um, a bunch of us went on um, tours in Georgian Bay, guided tours, and we learned how to kayak properly and how to camp um, tenting and you know what we should expect when we're out in the water we did that for two years and then after two years we ventured out on our own and we have now we're coming up to our 10th year this year of kayaking and tenting um, so we we have embraced it fully so I feel very comfortable in the kayak I feel very comfortable with the um equipment that we have and how to use it and fairly safe. And even though I shouldn't, I've often gone kayaking on my own in safe waters and always brought safety equipment along with me just in case I had to be out overnight. I had a little tent. I had everything in my kayak that I could survive a night in the woods if I had to. So fast forward to just last week. In our area, we have had, for May, an extremely unusual warm weather. Last week, it felt like July, July weather. And it can trick you into thinking that it is July. So everyone was out enjoying the day and a friend called up and said, do you have anything on today? Can you go kayaking with me? And so I jumped at the chance, of course, and we headed out to a well-known river. And this river um, can be very dangerous in high water and in spring. And I have been down it, but in late June and July, my friend has been on it. She, in fact, she had been on it only six days earlier with a canoe and um, traveled it very confidently and safely. So nothing was on my radar as far, as far as having dangers. So we headed out. It was beautiful, as I said, sunny day, 30 degrees. Um, people were in their bathing suits and people were on the water. And we um, had a delightful start. We, had, um, we were looking at the spring flowers along the shore. To, had a great experience of seeing eagles one at a nest, large nest, and the other looking over. And we, we took our time and uh, just enjoyed the day. 
Now on the river, there are parts that are very calm, but there are parts where, well, most of it has a very fast flowing current. And along with some of those currents, there are small sections that have ripples in the water and uh, you just navigate around them. Nothing, nothing was scary, um, but you, you, you are aware that you are in water that is swift. And of course the flow is very fast because it's May and the volume of water, the, the height of the water is at a high rate as well. As we traveled along, and enjoyed our day. We were going around a corner and um, my friend was going to stop at a sandbar to check it out. Um, she had seen turtle eggs there once before. So she was there and I was kind of distracted. I was looking at her and I think I grabbed my water bottle and I had been taking a drink. I was taking a drink out of it. I did not see what was coming ahead um, until the last minute and I realized I had drifted closer to shore and there was an overturned tree, a tree that had fallen into the water. And I just thought, well, what normally happens when I've hit a tree, you know, I bumped into a tree, I'm just gonna have a bump onto the tree and you know, I hope it doesn't scratch the kayak or that's about it. Never ever thought of any danger. But immediately when I hit the tree, my kayak was upturned and I was in the water. And this is spring water. So the first thing that I remember was the cold, I, the shock of first being in the water and my kayak being upturned. Second, the coldness of the water. And when I came up, I'm not sure how I did this, but I was, my arms were draped over uh, the log, the tree that was in the water. And I was hanging on and the pressure of the water behind me, the current, was pushing me up against that tree, making it very hard for me to breathe. So I was gasping for air at the beginning. So there was a moment, a moment of panic, panic, just from the shock of falling in, the shock of the water, and then the difficulty of breathing at first. Then I realized I was okay, but I kind of was still, you know, choking, trying to breathe. And I choked and yelled out to my friend, you know, what had happened. She immediately, you know, turned around and, and made her way over to me. Now, the odd thing is that I was on one side of my log, of the log, and my kayak was on the other side. And it, how it did not float away, I have no idea. I thought I had a hold of it the entire time, but my friend said when she turned around, I was just hanging on to the tree and my kayak mysteriously was still in place. So once I got my friend's attention and I knew I was okay, I grabbed hold of my kayak and made sure that it didn't go anywhere. Fortunately for me, I had safety equipment such as a paddle leash. First thing that I ever bought for my kayak on the advice of the person I was buying it from, they said the most important thing you need, Bonnie, is a paddle leash. And I am so grateful for that because my paddle did not float away. Remember, this current is so fast, so flowing that you can sit in your kayak and you don't even have to paddle because it just takes you down the river. So my paddle would have been gone. It's strange, while I was hanging on to that branch and waiting for my friend, all kinds of things were going through my mind. Once I knew that I could breathe and I was okay and my kayak was there, I kept think I thought things like, oh, Bonnie, your Apple Watch is probably destroyed now on your arm because it's been in the water. Uh, oh, Bonnie, that bag that you have and you always carry with you in the kayak, I had just taken it off the top of my, the deck of my kayak where it is secured and I had put it inside the cockpit with me because I was uh, concerned that my iPhone in it was getting too hot. So all the things that you know I travel with, my safety things were in that bag and it was free. It was not attached inside my kayak. So I thought, oh, that bag's gone. I, I don't have a phone. I don't have this and this and this. So I was imagining that. And then the next thing I thought of was, I have to hang on to this kayak because my friend cannot save both me and the kayak. 
So when she came, we assessed what we should try to do. There was no way, um, well, actually I had thought about, should I go under the tree, dive under the water, under the, the tree and be on the same side as my kayak? I am so grateful that I didn't do that. That would have been a huge mistake. So what we did is the shore was probably only six feet away to my right. I tried to start grabbing the tree, grabbing branches, grabbing anything I could and make my way over to the shore. The, the current was just so strong. I tried with all my might. Even my friend tried to push the kayak that way. We could not make it, even though it was so close, we could not make it to the shore. So we, the only thing we could think of is I have to get free of this tree. We have to get and be in the river and float down the river. My friend, unfortunately, when she came to rescue me, she was facing backwards. So when we finally got free of the tree and I just inched along to get to it, past it and out into the, water, the river, she was facing backwards. I was hanging onto her kayak and onto my kayak, which again, remember is upturned. And we are now being forced down the river with the current at its whim. We have no control because she's facing the wrong way. She can't paddle. She's backwards. She can't see. I can see, but I'm in the water. <laughs> so we ended up hitting, um, there was another tree that we came into. Fortunately, we, we just sort of went through the branches of that tree. Um, my friend said I kicked a branch out of the way. She closed her eyes because branches were hitting her. And she told me to close my eyes. And um, we, we, we were continuing down that way for a while. And I said, as soon as we have a little less current, we've got to get you turned around so we can have some direction. So I had to let go of her kayak, which was hard to do so that she could get turned around and then um, grab it again. So I grabbed her kayak, I grabbed my kayak, and now at least she was facing the right direction. We floated for quite a while before we could find a safe spot to get up. Now the river in spots was shallow and I could see the bottom and I tried, I put my feet, my feet down and I would try to, you know, stop us, but the flow was, it would immediately just take me out off my feet. There was no way I could do that. So eventually we saw a sandbar and um, when we spotted it, I said, you paddle as hard as you can towards that sandbar. And I kicked as hard as I could. And we made our way safely to the sandbar. And once the water was probably not even up to my knee is when I could eventually stand up in that water. It was so forceful. So we got to shore. Um, we upturned my kayak. And um, we took some time. <laughs> My friend dried out the kayak and pumped it out of water while I sat and just assessed what had happened. And lo and behold, miraculously, that bag that was unattached to my kayak and was in the cockpit with me, it was still there. And everything was dry, including my cell phone, um, my watch, she dried it out and it was working perfectly. There was only a couple things that I lost. Um, my water bottle that I had been drinking before, the, before I fell in, it was gone. And then I realized later the cockpit cover that I had just thrown in at the la um, off of my kayak when I got into the water, I'd thrown it behind my seat. So it was light and it, it was of course um, gone. Very small price to pay for what had happened. So we sat on the shore, giving thanks to God for our safety and praising him for his angels watching over me. And um, we were just appalled and at the same time and so concerned by the number of people that we saw. because so we must have saw at least eight or 10 others on the river with us that day. But when we were sitting on the shore, and I was trying to dry out. 
two ladies, two young women went by on their kayaks in bikinis, no footwear, no, no um, flotation device on, like no personal, personal flotation device. And we just, we just thought, do they know the dangers that are lurking here? Would they be able to have handled it? We had some training, we had, you know, we didn't panic. We were able to, to navigate that, but would they have been able to with um, no flotation device? Because I, I didn't have to think about swimming. I didn't have to be thinking about keeping my head above water. All of that was because I had my life jacket on. So my, my desire afterwards was I have to warn people. I have to tell people that even when you have all this equipment or you have some training and if you are not aware of your situation, aware of the um, day, like for instance, to us, it was a July day. To the river, it was still a May day, a high water, high risk um, situation to be in. And so today I just wanted to tell people my story and then offer a few hints, things that I've learned since then as I've done some research and made myself more knowledgeable to do this if I did in the future. Bonnie, I wanna thank you for sharing that and being transparent and vulnerable with sharing the experience with us. What are the takeaways that you can share with the audience from what you learned from this experience? Well, as my friend and I thought back and assessed and you know looked at this situation, first of all, we wanted to put up a big sign as people went down this river that they would read it and say, oh, these are the dangers that I need to look out for. Um, because I don't think you know, out of those 10 people that we saw, none of them had life jackets on. None of them were probably properly equipped with any kind of safety things other than, you know, what is required for boating laws. So our, our concern was we need to get the word out. So I did some additional research from my training because my training did not prepare me for different, different kinds of um, situations such as a river in spring as opposed to a lake or you know fast water we didn't have any kind of that of those trainings um we didn't have training on what would you do if you were caught up in a tree or even what that, that's called those obstacles in water so some of the things that i saw and i apologize if i look down but i just don't want to miss anything important so four elements that you should consider before you go down a river are, and I'll, I'll actually add a, a fifth, first of all, the flow. So that's the volume of water that's heading downstream. Second, if there's any gradient. So that means, is there change in elevation? Is there change from when, you know, you start at a higher level and then does it gradually get down lower or, or does it go up? Um, the third are obstructions. And this is the big one that I was unaware of. These are called sweepers and strainers. And I will talk a little bit more about that. And there was, this was not a case for us, but boulders can also be if there's rocks because little eddies can form around them in fast water. And the fourth is constriction. So that means if you had a, a wide body of water and it has to now, all the flow of that water has to fit into a narrower part. So of course, it's going to rise in that narrow part and it's going to make it more dangerous. That really wasn't a case for me either in this situation. But the fifth thing that I would um, add to that in considering a river safety is the time of year. So we were tricked into the beautiful, unusually warm weather that we were having in May, but it was still, it's still May. So there's still a huge amount of water going down that river and a huge amount of um, strength and um, the current is very, very strong. So um, all those things need to be considered. So some of the dangers of all of this and dangers that I could have faced in this situation of going down a river when it's very fast flowing is number one, I could have had hypothermia or cold weather shock 
cold water, sorry, shock. I felt that coldness of the water, but amazingly enough, when I got out of the water, I did not have the shake, shakes or chills. I did not have to be warmed up. I mean, it was beautiful 30 degrees out, but I didn't experience any of that. But it said that sudden immersion in dangerously cold weather, so that's any water temperature, um, 60 degrees Fahrenheit and below, which is probably what I was in, can render you incapable of controlling your breathing. So the most important thing is that first minute of exposure when the hypothermia, you get that cold shock and it can rip the air from your chest and you can actually have difficulty breathing. So that's probably what I experienced initially when I felt like I couldn't breathe. It was the cold shock of the water. So it says um, in the information, and we'll share this below in the, in the um, description, that there's a one ten one rule. So one minute to gain control of your breathing. So I did do that right. I got my breath. 10 minutes of meaningful movement to, uh, to attempt self-rescue. And one hour before you lose consciousness due to hypothermia. So that is a general rule. It's called the one ten one rule. Fortunately, we didn't have to go through all of that. Second thing that can be a danger is um, overstepping your ability. So getting yourself in a situation that you haven't been prepared for. I really do feel we were prepared as far as our skills or um, experience or our ability in this situation. But those other paddlers that we, that we saw going by, I'm not sure, so sure. So always choose a route that meets your skill level, that your skill level will allow you to go down it properly. The next thing was capsizing. And of course, that's what I did. And it happened in a split second. I mean, I remember seeing the log and then all of a sudden I'm in the water and just, you know, can't believe it. So it happened so fast. And I have friends that have capsized on a beautiful day just with a quick turn in that kayak, enough to overturn them. So even when you think that you aren't, you will. There's this great saying, it says, if you, um, haven't, if you haven't done it yet, well, it's not a matter of if you're going to, it's a matter of when you will capsize eventually. So we had been trained on self-rescue, so a wet exit, it's called also, if we wear a skirt and the skirt's what you put around your cockpit so you're all closed in, I am so thankful I wasn't wearing my skirt. When we left to, to go to head out that day, I had my skirt because I, I often will wear, it, especially if I think I'm going to get wet from paddling or if I think it's too cold. Well, in this case, it wasn't cold, but I did go through my mind, should I wear my skirt? I thought, no, I'm not going to wear my skirt. It's too, it's too warm out. Had I been in my skirt when I overturned, then I would have had to have, you know, unhooked myself and I would have been underwater. I wouldn't have just naturally fallen out, not having my skirt on. So that was a real blessing, not having it on. So capsizing, you, you can get, um, after you flip, you could get caught, trapped under your kayak. Um, first of all, if you wore a skirt, but second of all, by the things that are around you. So in this case, the tree that I had, had been caught under, and I'll give you some more about that right now. So hazards, obstacles, and this is the thing that I really wasn't trained in. So strainers and sweepers, these were totally new concepts. I had to look them up and found out that these are real dangers, one of the most dangerous things for kayakers. So anything that you see on the water, often it's like an iceberg. You see something on the water, but there's a lot more underneath. So sweepers are the low hanging branches and obstacles. So a tree has just fallen, which is often the case on a river because of erosion. So if a tree has fallen and what you see, those low hanging branches over top of the water, that's called a sweeper. 
what I experienced was a strainer. A strainer is the underwater obstacle. So the tree has fallen, but you only see, in my case, the log and a few branches, but underneath there could be a whole bunch of more branches or roots or whatever. And it's called a strainer because the water goes through it, but everything that hits it remains. So any kind of other obstacles, sticks and logs and things, and even man-made objects can become strainers, like a fence that falls in or something. All the things that go down a river can accumulate there. So when I went under, if I had decided to go under the log, I could have got myself caught in some of that debris that's underneath. So strainers can be very, very dangerous. Another thing is when the kayak flips, Sometimes people get caught underwater in some of that debris. So again, very dangerous. Um, the best way that to get out of one of those things, they say, is to try to climb up on it. That never even crossed my mind in my case. And I don't know if I could have. So my experience with trees in the water before this was always it's just a nuisance, or maybe I bump into it, or maybe I tie my kayak to it so I can have a rest. Um, it's never, I never once thought of it as a danger, but do not approach these kinds of obstacles when you're in fast flowing water. The next thing that it can be a danger is improper use or incorrect equipment. So the improper use of it or having the impro improper equipment. So some of the things that you need definitely to be aware of when you're kayaking is the most important one is you must wear your life preserver. You have to have that personal flotation device on it. And if you're in a kayak, there are kayak um, life jackets to use. You should not be wearing um, something that's um, maybe appropriate for another kind of boat. You need to have one that's going to operate correctly for you as a kayaker. In my case, I had a proper one on, so immediately when I fell out of the kayak, it, it brought me up. So that, that it did its job. And that's what you need to look for, have the proper equipment. Um, the next thing is uh, having footwear. We often don't think about this, but when it's a nice, beautiful, warm, calm day, I've often gone out on my kayak with just a pair of sandals or perhaps a pair of shoes that would easily fall off. But that day I decided I was going to wear my water shoes. That was such a blessing because I had the proper footwear. They stayed on despite the, the um, fast flowing water. So having footwear on, which again, none of those other kayakers that we saw on the river that day had even any footwear on. But be aware of that. You may have to touch bottom. You may have to, um, you know, like me, be capsized or I had to have proper footwear on. So I'm so grateful. The next thing is a paddle leash. If I did not have, it's just something that attaches to your, ki your, your kayak and to your oar so that if you do overturn, you will still have your paddle with you. I am so grateful because if I had lost that, again, we would have been in um, a more precarious situation. So make sure that that paddle is going to stay with your kayak if you overturn. Next thing is you should have a, what um, they refer to as a float plan. So in our case, it's a, um, we had told both of our husbands approximately how much time we would be on that river and when they were going to come and pick us up. After my, my, my fall in the water, when we were sitting on shore, we did text not to tell them what happened. We waited for that part, but to inform him that we were going, we were on um, shore and we were having a break and we were having a snack and that we would be delayed. So making sure that whoever is supposed to pick you up or come by, um, or even if you have your own transportation, that they have a, an approximate time of when you're to be expected back. Because if something had happened, and my friend could not have helped me, then um, at least we knew that somebody would come looking for us. The next thing is 
um, they recommend if you're in fast water to have a throw line. Now, as part of the requirement in a kayak, you must have a line, you must have rope, but it's safely stowed away in a container that you would have to take the lid off. You would have to take out the other pieces that were in that safety kit for a boat and then get the rope and then untangle it. And by the time you did that, the reason you were getting it out might be gone. So um, that was something new to me that I will um, be purchasing a throw line. And this is a line that you can actually throw out to someone in case they need to be pulled in. And it comes out automatically. One part stays with you. The other part has a flotational kind of thing on it. So it's easier for the person to grab. And then you can get that person in. So that's a piece of equipment I was unaware of. Don't skimp on safety equipment and have everything tied down on your kayak. You don't know when that time might come when you fall in. So have everything attached. Do your research. This is extremely important. Do your research and, um, before you go down a river. So if it's something you have not been on before, make sure you talk to people who have traveled it. Make sure it's the right time of year that you should be on it. Do your research, look into it all. And the most important one out of all of this is never kayak alone. You have to have a buddy. If I had not had my friend with me that day, there is no way I could have got out of bed. I would have had to wait in the water in that cold temperature with the power of the force behind me pushing me up against that log. I would have had to wait for someone to come and rescue me. Always travel with a buddy. And even the recommendations I saw for fast water, you should have at least three people with you. Three is even better than two. That's my message today to anybody out there that's a kayaker. Um, don't be lulled into thinking just because you have warm weather that it might be safe to go down a spring river, one with a fast current. I implore you to do your research and be safe. Wani, you fell in love with kayaking. I have a question. Are you still in love with kayaking? And when are you going out again? Definitely, I am in love with kayaking. My, the first question my friend asked me was, has this, has this um, persuaded you not to go kayaking again? Or have you got trauma now around kayaking? Definitely not. In, in fact, it's, I can't wait to go again. But I also know that, you know, I've done research. I will continue to do research. I, and I'm talking to all my kayak friends about my situation so they can be aware and be safe. It's just um, given me more knowledge and knowledge is a good thing, especially in a skill such as this that you might come into harm's way. So I love kayaking. <laughs> There's my little kayak and I will continue to kayak. I give him glory for getting us out of that. You know, there's those other 10 people that went down that river successfully, uneventfully, no problems at all. It's that 1%, is that one time, sorry, 10%, that one time out of 10 that something might happen. So let's be prepared. Let's know the risk. Let's prepare as best as we can. Um, don't go in blind. Don't go in, you know, thinking that um, there's no risk because there is. There is always a risk. So um, make yourself as knowledgeable as you can and as safe as you can and go out and enjoy your paddle. Well, thank you for listening to my story today, um, giving me the opportunity to, to share my passion. And it is a passion. I love kayaking and I don't want to dissuade anyone from enjoying that beautiful passion of being out in God's creation, paddling. It's, it's therapeutic to me. Um, so I thank you for allowing me to do that. If you've listened to my story or you have comments on any of our shows, you can write us at recoveringyourvoice at gmail.com. 
recoveringyourvoice at gmail.com. And until next time, share your stories. You're taking a chance with me, but hey, <laughs> lesser of the two evils, honey, okay? <laughs> You're going to have to trust us. I will have to trust you. <laughs> I just snorted. <laughs> just bumped up or sometimes I'd be even tired. Could you say that again? Hmm. I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> okay, Good. sorry. Go ahead, honey. Do your thing. <laughs> we have um, a, a large size peanut butter jar that we hold everything in, okay? <laughs> Our emergency <laughs> device is like, whoo, whoo. <laughs> Carol Ann, you can just smile, look pretty. <laughs>